I greet you all in Jesus' precious name. Welcome to my Postinia, my quiet time room. I am just so excited to be able to speak to you today about something that is so close to my heart. My dear friend, this is a two-part series, and we've called it the Nicodemus Experience. The most important thing in the Christian walk of life is the fact that a man must meet with God. What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and he loses his soul? Mark chapter 8 verse 36. So right at the outset, I want to tell you about this two-part program, which I think is most exciting. I've spent a lot of time in prayer. I've spent a lot of time in preparation. And the more I prepared, the more excited I got. Folks, you know, we can look after our physical body. We can look after our ambitions and our visions. Okay, and that's wonderful. But we are talking about eternal life. And this is what I want to speak to you about today. So we're not going to waste any time. We're going straight into the Word of God. I've got my Bible right in front of me. I'm going to read to you from John chapter 3 and from verses 1 through to verse 10. Straight. There was a man of the Pharisees, and his name was Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night, and he said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Verse 3, Jesus answered and he said to him, Most assuredly I say to you, that unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Verse 4, Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Verse 5, Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. Verse 8, the wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but you cannot tell where it comes from and where it is going to. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered, and he said to him, how can these things be? And Jesus answered and said, he said to Nicodemus, Are you the teacher of Israel? And you do not know these things. Just this far, this is the word of the Lord. And unto his name be all praise, honor, and glory forever. My dear friend, here's a situation where a man who is a member of the Sanhedrin, the Sanhedrin, in those days, was the governing, governing body of Israel. He was a man with great authority. They tell us that the Sanhedrin could even determine life or death over one of the Jews. And yet he didn't want the rest of the members of the Sanhedrin to know that he was coming to this carpenter from Nazareth, so he came by night. How many of us want to follow Jesus, but we don't want anybody to know about it? Folks, there is no such thing as a Lone Ranger Christian. There are no secret agents in the kingdom of God. I know that's a joke. We need to be a little bit more outspoken. We should be like uh, the Bible says in Romans chapter 1 and verse 16, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation for those who believe. First the Jew and then the Gentile. We need to be more outspoken. Nicodemus came by night. He didn't want anybody to find out that he was there. Why did he come? He came because he knew that this man from Nazareth was not just a carpenter. 
He was not just a Nazarene. He was a man sent from God. Why? Because of the miracles and the signs and the wonders that he performed. Now, I want to speak to you today about regeneration. I want to speak to you in the next two series. I want to speak to you about a difference. You cannot tell me that you love Jesus Christ and there's no difference in your, in your character, in your personality, in your heart. You see, John Newton was a slave ship captain. I don't think you can think of anything worse. He was a captain of a ship that took poor people from Africa to um, the USA and to Britain and to the West Indies as slaves. Many of them were turfed overboard because they died on the trip. It was so hellish. And he was a captain of one of those ships. And he met Jesus Christ and he was born again, just like Jesus told Nicodemus. And my dear friend, I'm going to pray for you at the end of this program. Because if you're not born again, you need to be born again. Why? Because Jesus said so. This is not a charismatic or an evangelical term. This is a Jesus term. And you and I are running out of time. There is no time left to sit down and to question God. John Newton changed just like that. One minute he was a slave ship captain. The next minute he was serving God. He wrote probably the most famous hymn. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. In a believer's ear, I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. There's got to be a change in your life when you become a Christian. Some of you are sitting there and you're saying to me, but Angus, you know, I come from a Christian home. My father was a minister. My grandfather was a minister. My family. But you, sir, need to find Jesus for yourself. And that is the most important thing for you today. It's not about whether you follow a denomination. It's not about whether you follow a man of God. You see, no denomination and no individual man of God died for your sins. There was only one who died for your sins, and his name was Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And we need to repent. That means we need to change. And we need to follow after him. You see, what Jesus was meaning by being born again, there's got to be a turning point in your life. See, you're walking this way, then all of a sudden you stop. And you turn around and you walk the other way. There's got to be regeneration. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Some of you that I'm speaking to are suffering at the moment with depression, anxiety, and fear. How do you know, Angus? Because the Lord has told me so. And you don't understand why. You are successful in business. You've got a beautiful family, but there is no peace in your heart. Well, I'm going to tell you a few stories of mighty men and women of God that changed the world that were in the same predicament as you. They had no peace, no fulfillment. Okay, they'd worked hard. They got their degrees. They'd, they'd found a beautiful helpmeet. They got married. They had beautiful children, but still no peace. I was one of them. I was one of them. When I left Zambia in 1976, a young man, I was in my 20s. All I wanted to do was to have my own farm in South Africa. And I thought then I would find peace. Well, I want to tell you something. I had a beautiful young wife. I have five beautiful children now grown up. I'm a grandfather 11 times over. I have many spiritual sons. I got that farm, a beautiful farm. I'm on it right now. It belongs to my children now. But you know something? I had no peace. No peace. No peace. No assurance of salvation. I was not sure that if I died tomorrow, I would go to heaven. I was not sure of that. I hoped so, but I wasn't sure. And you sit in there today, sir, and you say, Angus, I'm not sure either. And I'm actually a minister. <laughs> yes. Don't be surprised. I'm going to tell you some stories of men that not only were they ministers, but they were high up in the church, men with degrees, who still were not born again. You see, we need to be born again in order to have that reassurance of eternal life. If we look at uh, 2 Corinthians 
chapter 3 and verse 6, the Bible says clearly, the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. So you can know the Bible. You can know the Bible from Genesis right through to Revelation. But if you're not born again, all you are is a history teacher. And I'm not being disrespectful. You see, Jesus didn't call you and I to follow a denomination or to follow a group of men or to follow a certain minister, charismatic minister. No. Jesus called us to follow him. See? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. John chapter 3 verse 16. That's the Bible. I've just quoted the whole Bible from Genesis to Revelation in one verse. That is it. Now, unless you're born again, you will not find that peace. You will not find a reason for living. You will just keep on looking. Now, I want to tell you today, you don't have to do that anymore. Okay? We need to follow Jesus Christ and Him alone because He's the only one that died for your sins and my sins. You see what happened to me? I came to the end of my tether. I couldn't go on anymore. I was working 16, 18 hours a day. This was my little house right here, sitting in the lounge. Okay? Since then, we've built on a little bit. So Jill and I stay next door, and this has become my quiet time room. This very lounge. I built it in three weeks. That's right. I had three children, and Jill was pregnant with our fourth child. Okay, I couldn't speak the local language, Zulu. I didn't know when it rained here. We had no telephones. We had no, we had no cell phones in those days. <laughs> we had no electricity, no water. I didn't even know what time of the year it was to plant my crops. And so I started from minus one. Well, by the grace of God, I didn't even know that at the time. I managed to come through. I had a beautiful crop of maize. We managed to find water on the farm. We managed to get electricity into the house. We managed to get a telephone, etc., but no peace. And then I was getting very troubled in my spirit because I thought to myself, if I could have got my own farm, and I'm talking to a young man here now, it doesn't matter what you're aiming for, son. If you're not born again, you will never find that peace that you're looking for. The peace of God, which passes all understanding the Bible talks about. Be still and know that I am God. Right? I think you'll find that in Psalm 46 and verse 10. And so Jill and I went to the little church in Great Town. It's about 15 kilometers away from here on a Sunday morning. And we sat there and we heard the gospel preached. And I broke down. My pride went out the window. An altar call was made. Those who want to be born again, come to the front. Jill got up, I got up, and all our children. We went to the front. And that was on the 18th of February, 1979. Now, as I tell you that, some of you are saying to me, is it important to have a date? Yes, it is, actually. It's very important. You might not know the exact date like I do. I even know the exact hour. It was about 10 o'clock in the morning. My life was transformed. It's the greatest day of my life. After that, I was baptized. But I want to say something to you now. There's got to be a time in your life when you have had a Nicodemus experience. Because if you haven't, you can't just inherit the kingdom of God because your mom and your dad were Christians. There are no grandchildren in the kingdom of God. What does that mean, Angus? It means if I'm a Christian, there's no guarantee my children will be Christians. They have to meet Jesus Christ for themselves individually. What I can do is I can teach them, I can bring them up in the ways of the Lord, but there'll come a time when they have to make a decision to accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Now you say to me, can you, can, can you confirm that? And I can. And I'll tell you how I can confirm that. Probably the greatest conversion experience in the Bible, definitely probably the most dramatic, was a man called Saul of Tarsus. 
Now, Saul of Tarsus was also a member of the Sanhedrin. He was a learned man. He was a godly man. He was passionate for God. He was on fire for God. He was so committed to God that he was hunting down the Christians and killing them. I don't think you can get more passionate than that. If you go to Israel, if you have the privilege of ever going to Israel, and you go through the Lion's Gate, going down towards the Garden of Gethsemane, on the crossroads there, there's a, there's a church there, an Orthodox church, a Greek Orthodox church. Underneath the road there, there's a big rock. And that is the rock where they took Stephen, the first martyr in the New Testament, and they stoned him to death. And you know who organized that? That's quite right. Saul of Tarsus. In fact, he was holding the cloaks of the men that were throwing rocks at a man of God. And why were they killing him? Simply for one reason only. Why most martyrs die. All martyrs die. Because he said that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That was all he said. And for that, he paid the ultimate price. He is a martyr, and he is seated right around close to the throne of Jesus with the other martyrs. Saul of Tarsus was a radical follower of God. But he had never met Jesus Christ. He had never been born again. In fact, he regarded Jesus Christ as an imposter. He said, the Messiah is still coming. And Stephen said, no. No, no, he's not coming. He's already come. And he's going to come a second time. And Stephen looked up and he said, I can see Jesus sitting at the right hand of God the Father when they were killing him. And while they were stoning Stephen to death, he said, Lord, don't hold this sin against him today. What an incredible testimony. Well, we know what happened. Saul of Tarsus, he got on his horse with his men and he made his way to Damascus. He was going to persecute the Christians in Damascus. This was not a lukewarm Christian. This was not just a church goer on Sundays. This was a passionate man who was dedicating his whole life to serving God. And he missed it completely. There might be one or two that are watching this program that are in the same boat. You are working so hard for the Lord. Maybe you're working in soup kitchens. Maybe you're taking care of the poor and the needy. Maybe you're working in a rural area trying to upgrade uh, emerging farmers. Maybe you're a teacher and you are teaching uh, education in some third world country and you think you're doing a great work for God. And you are, by the way. You definitely are. But unless you are born again, it is wasting time and it is chasing the wind. As Solomon, the wisest man that ever lived, said, chasing the wind. And so what happened? On his way to Damascus, we know the story, but I'm going to remind you. He was knocked off his horse in the middle of the day, flat on the ground, and all his men around him didn't know what had happened. There was a bright light shining in the middle of the day, knocked him off the horse. And he heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he looked up and he couldn't see anything and he said, who are you? He says, I am Jesus who you are persecuting. From that moment onwards, Saul was struck blind. Folks, you have to have a testimony. You cannot tell me you just drifted into Christianity. There's got to be a time, there's got to be a date, and there's got to be a moment when you met the Lord. And you say, I haven't had that. Well, you need to seek it, and you need to find it. They took him to Damascus, to Straight Street. You know the story. Ananias came. He didn't want to. They'd heard about this man that was killing Christians. And he prayed over uh, a sword of Tarsus. Scales fell from his eyes. He could see again. And that was the beginning of Paul, the apostle, who's my favorite apostle in the Bible, who wrote two-thirds of the Bible, who opened the gospel to the whole world as it was known then. And he suffered more than any other apostle. That is a testimony of a man changed. They stoned him. They beat him. He was shipwrecked. He was starved. He was misunderstood. And eventually he had his head cut off in Rome. Are you going to tell me that Jesus Christ is a figment of my imagination? My dear friend, there's no one that will pay a price like that 
for some fairy tale. Jesus is more real to me than you sitting watching this program. Now, this is part one. I'm still going to go on to part two. And I'm going to speak about men who had a Nicodemus experience like Paul did. I'm talking about men of the caliber of John Wesley, Martin Luther. I'm talking about men like Nicky Cruz. That's right. Crossing the switchblade. Each one of these men that I'm going to speak about in the next uh, part of this program, all were born again. Each and every one had a Damascus Road experience. Charles Haddon Spurgeon. At the age of 19 years old, folks, he'd only been converted four years. He was pre preaching to a congregation of 10,000 people. That is nothing short of miraculous. No television in those days. No cell phones. No Twitter, Instagram. No Facebook. I want to tell you, when God comes into a man's life, he transforms it. The Bible says to us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17, If any man be in Christ... If any man is born again, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So I want to pray for you at the end of part one. And then I'm going to see you in part two. And I believe part two is really going to excite you. Because folks, we need Jesus Christ now more than ever before. You know, People ask me to pray for the sick because I do pray for the sick. I'm an evangelist. But what's more important to me is for a man's spirit to be healed. For a man to have his spiritual eyes opened. We walk by faith and not by sight. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7. So let us pray. You're sitting in your house there. I don't know where you are. Let us pray the sinner's prayer. And we're going to pray that same prayer at the end of the next program as well. Please pray after me. Dear Lord Jesus, that's right, pray that after me. I repent of all my sins. I ask you to be the Lord of my life. I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you are crucified. I believe that you died. And I believe on the third day you rose from the dead and ascended into heaven and are sitting at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. And I believe that you are coming back to take me home to be with you in glory one of these fine days. Until then, Lord, give me the strength to keep on with the faith. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, may God bless you until the next time. Goodbye.